Well, I was optimistic about Bible study when I printed 25, I guess. Yeah, it's tough when it's when COVID is so high. Yeah, that's true too. It is the long weekend. I forget about that. Hi, Jen. Did you have fun celebrating Dylan's birthday? Good. Both hands. Do you know where you're going? Okay. Well, we're beginning our Bible study here on Judges chapter 13 through 15, gentlemen. Uh, A few others are making their way in as well Uh, as we move from coffee time. We've got Bible studies are going on today. Uh, Having a Heart of Hope is a Bible study that Dr. Nims is leading. Crossroads, uh, the former bookstore room, has uh, the first session of Lutheranism 101. And uh, Chrissy Van Dellen in... Uh, the pastor's conference room, which used to be the chapel or Pastor Sherbert's office. Now we're calling it the pastor's conference room. Um, there's a women's Bible study that's looking at, uh, um, uh, it's a series that they're doing that's looking at just the whole timeline of the Bible. And there's about, I don't know, six, seven women in that. There's about 50. So though you see us five strong in here, six strong, we, people are in the Word in this church. And it, it is also a long weekend for schools. Most schools don't have school on Monday. Uh, and so the, some people are having a chance to get it ready for that. Next week is National Lutheran Schools Week. Uh, uh, we'll be launching uh, our week-long emphasis on the joy of Lutheran schools. Uh, there will be children's choirs at all of our services at 6 and 8, 30 and 11. So that will be fun to have the choirs at all those services. Uh, today's Bible study is going to be on Judges chapter 13 through 15. And the main point of this section is going to be God graciously providing a deliverer. Um, and even as we see Samson kind of having some sinful desires, uh, it is going to be the one through whom God works. We have a map here of the area. I want you to especially notice the cities of Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Timnah and Gath. And uh, these are cities of the Philistines. And we'll start our study in a moment, just learning a little bit more about the Philistines. They're kind of a, um, a common enemy for the people, but they're, what we know about them is, is kind of brief. And so we'll, we'll try to see what we can know about them. And... Uh, I'm just going to ask you, friends, is it my absence of reading glasses right now, or is the 13, 1 through 25, kind of blurry on your printout? All right. I don't believe that. Look at mine. Maybe mine's uniquely blurry. No. (laughs) I think I'll go get my reading glasses. It is blurry, Al. <laughs> All right. All right. So Judges chapter 13, if you want to turn your Bibles to there, it will be a good place to start. Um, for those of you who are wondering on the basement, um, our Board of Finance has accepted a contract from a contractor to finish it up. And um, now we're going to have that approved at the church council. And uh, hopefully it gets done. It's, it's been discouraging. But I'm looking forward to it getting done. We start with this prayer. Forgive us, Lord, for the thoughtful, thoughtless and foolish words that we may speak. And guide us to speak the truth of your word in love to those around us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so the Philistines. This chapter 13 is the seventh cycle of apostasy. Apostasy is that word that describes when someone stands apart from God. So apo is a prefix that means away from, um, like opposition. 
is a little bit like that. But, um, and stasis is a, a word that means to stand. And so in Greek, when you put uh, stasis and apo, apo together, it's someone who stands away from. So apostasy is a theological term that we use to describe when someone has placed their trust and confidence in something other than God. They're an apostate, they're an apostasy, those are kind of the ways it means. And this is the cycle of the book of Judges, where the people uh, have a time of peace, and during that time of peace, they start to stand away from God and instead trust in false gods. Um, and we'll, we'll read in this chapter a little bit, um, in the whole chapter in just a moment, but I wanted to introduce uh, the Philistines. They lived on the coast. Sometimes they're also known as the Sea Peoples by some other Mediterranean cultures' writings. Uh, they attacked the Egyptians and other Mediterranean civilizations. Um, 14th through 12th century, we've got records of, quote, sea peoples that were using the sea to travel and attack. And uh, so they attacked the Egyptians and others, and uh, then they started to settle in around the 12th century B.C. into the five cities of Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, Gath, Gaz, and they also then are in Timna as well. But so Gath is where, uh, in Gaza, um, these, these cities become the headquarters, you could say. Now, if we do a biblical search, we could maybe find some reference in Genesis 10, uh, the Cashelites, uh, who were descendants of Mizraim, the son of Ham. But even the Talmud, which was being um, 3rd, 4th century B.C., even their Talmudic authors. So the Talmud developed as, uh, here's how the Talmud developed. So you've got the people coming back from as uh, exile. And not as many of them are speaking Hebrew. We even know from the book of Ezra that the, um, the reading of the book of the law that takes place in the book of Ezra also has people moving around the crowd as the law is being read on this big stand that's been built. Uh, People, scribes, are moving around the crowd and explaining to them what they're hearing. That's the tradition of the Talmud, is to be able to explain the... It's kind of like a Bible commentary. So if you hear about the Talmud, the Talmud is largely meant to, to be a biblical commentary. But already the Talmud um, was helping to explain to people that the Philistines that were in that this time period are not the Philistines that are likely mentioned in Genesis 10. So there's some long tradition to say there's more than one group that's been known as Philistines. So the Torah and the Talmud are different. Yeah, they're different, but that's, that's what the Jewish people use the, the Torah and the Talmud. So the, the Jewish scriptures would be the Torah the Nafim, which would be the prophets, and the, the Ketum, the uh, wisdom literature. So sometimes it's referred to by the phrase Tanakh, which takes Tanah, Nafim, and Ketum. And so those three, the, the Torah, the first five books, the, the prophets, and then the, the wisdom literature. So that would be their, and then they'll have, on, next to that, they'll have the Talmud, which is their Lutheran study Bible, um, and then the Mishnah, will be another one that they would have. And the Mishnah are um, often best made, describe them as short stories. And um, taking um, kind of something that's not fully explained in the scripture and adding fuller story about it. The Mishnah stories are not always meant to be canonical like they actually happen, but they become um, a little bit more like allegorical lessons. So those are the, the things that they would use. Yeah. Um, so who are the Philistines? There's some archaeological evidence to connect them to the Aegeans, the ancient Greeks. Their pottery is very similar, and their language, um, though, I'm sorry, their pottery, their language, and the skeletal remains that have been found in archaeological digs at these five cities demonstrate that they were a transcultural group consisting of people of various origins. So it's hard to say the Philistines are a bunch of Mycenaeans that then traveled around the Mediterranean and then settled in these five cities. What's more likely is it might have been at a core some Mycenaeans from the Aegean Sea area, but that along the way they were apparently a, a rather 
um, potpourri culture because their pottery, their, the origins of some of the language that we have from them, the skeletal remains that are at these cities, they all show just a, a very wide variety of people. So it's hard to s pinpoint one city somewhere and say that's where they all came from. So that's who the Philistines are. Pretty much we don't know. <laughs> um, but they become, during the time of David and this later period of Judges, the, the big enemy. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to read from chapter 13. We're going to, um, some of the things I want you to notice is how the narrator and the storytelling across uh, three, four chapters is going to uh, build up a cycle of story about Samson. And it's, it's rather unique. Uh, there are not many people in the Old Testament that take up this many chapters. You know, you can almost count them on your hand. Um, Abraham, uh, Joseph, um, Samuel, um, you've got uh, here Samson, uh, David, and, and um, Solomon. And after Solomon, there, then the prophet Elijah. But th there's not many, is my point. So it, it's helpful for us to kind of see this emphasis. And I think one of the things we see with Samson as a judge is um, some remarkable um, humanity. As much as he's kind of this Marvel character with his amazing strength, he's rather human as well with his struggles with integrity. So, here we go. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. And I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, so then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us, and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But, Noah, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I, all that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, and offered it on the rock of, to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. 
And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanaadan between Zorah and Eshtol. All right, so that is our chapter. What is some building of expectation that happens here? So you have the, the appearance that arrives to the woman first. Then she goes and tells her husband. And you see this pattern of echo? That's something that we, we also found in, in, in Joshua, where Joshua would hear something from the Lord, then Joshua would tell it to the people, and then the people would do it. This is a sign of integrity in God's word, that you are hearing what God has said, and you hear the consistency of her words to her husband. And you see that's a, a, a sense that she is believing these words because she is keeping them secure. She's not varying the words as she speaks them. Yes, Tammy. Right. Yeah, that becomes a jumping point for us to think of all the different times God has spoken to a woman who was barren and how did the women react. You've got Sarah who laughs. You've got Zechariah who wants a sign and becomes mute. Um, and here, Manoah's like, God, I want to hear more. What a wonderful desire that is. God, tell us more. Um, and it's not from a place of doubt. It's just, we want to do this right. Um, tell us how we're supposed to raise this child. Um, and when the angel does come again, there's actually not much instruction about how to raise the child. It's, do what I already told you. Um, so then the angel of the Lord comes again. And you'll notice that the description now becomes a little bit more specific. So at first it was, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman, but there's not that much emphasis on, on the appearance or things like that. Then she describes the appearance. Then the man appears, the angel appears to Manoah, and then um, there is just this sense of growing conviction that this is, this is a godly thing that's happening. Yes. Yeah. And so what is the emphasis of that? Um, is, is just one, one Bible study note is going to point out that when someone stayed at your table, they had to stay throughout the whole cycle of hospitality. And so that, uh, that word detain is a very interesting word choice in our Bible translation. Let me detain you. And we have kind of a negative connotation with the word detain. And that's, I think, as they try to translate, they're trying to show what Manoah is doing with this invitation. He, he is trying to detain. He's trying to hold this moment longer. And, and the idea is, as long as you're here, I know these words are true. As soon as you go... I begin to doubt again. And so then, um, instead of though detaining, the angel of the Lord knows what you need to see is not me at your dinner table. You need to know in the burnt offering that God has heard your prayer. Um, and our own sense of um, wanting to hold on to a moment and think that if, if it's always before my eyes, then I know it's true. But faith then becomes evidenced in how we live when it's not before our eyes. And that's what Manoah is being encouraged to have. I think so. It is, yeah, a parallel to the Mount of Transfiguration. And the angel of the Lord is seen by Christians when it's so clearly you know, emphasized it's the angel of the Lord, that that's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ himself. How would you assess the spirituality of Samson's parents? So I give you some choices. Fanatics, committed, lukewarm, methodical, angelic. What word do you think best describes the spirituality of Samson's parents? Fanatics, committed, lukewarm, methodical, angelic. Committed is Ron's choice. Yeah. They're committed. They want to know how to do it more. 
Uh, they're kind of methodical, methodical too, like you gave us instructions. We want to know, like, what's the method for these instructions? Manoah's request in his prayer is fascinating to me. Please let the man of God whom you sent come again to teach us so that we can do it right. So there's both some committed, some methodical. Um, I, lukewarm, I don't think, describes it, that's for sure. So it's, it's, uh, Al's making the point that it's not an adult that's fully formed, that's known by the community. This is going to be one that they have some responsibility to care for and raise up. Um, another thing that's just a detail that we, we kind of jumped by, but there's not a cry from the people. Um, in, in some of the other cycles that we've experienced in Judges, God hands them over to an enemy. You got the time period that they're in the enemy, and then they cry to God for a deliverer, and God raises up a deliverer. There's no cycle of the people crying. God is already, in a way, preemptively saying, I'm going to do something. We're going to now learn a little bit more. Oh, question three. The team of them, as a husband and wife team, how do you assess them working together? Does Manoah trust his wife? Is he... Do you, do you feel like he's accusatory that you saw this man? I want to see this man. I want, or is he more like, you saw a man? I want to see him too. What, do you think he's accusatory or he wants to be invited into it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a fascinating illustration of, um, you know, you, you've, you've got the same scenario with Joseph and Mary. Mary comes, you know, and says, I saw this man and I'm going to be pregnant. Uh, she says, I saw this man, and I'm going to be pregnant. Now, this isn't going to be an immaculate conception. It's, I mean, there's not reference to that. But, yeah, Tammy. Yeah, she goes and gets him. So as soon as, as, soon as uh, she's in the field, and, and I, I love that the man is there waiting. The, the angel of the Lord is there waiting for her to come back with Manoah. All right, now to learn more about what a Nazarite vow is. So turn to Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink, and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried, all the days of his separation. He shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head, until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall not let the locks of his hair, hair of his head, grow long. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. So there's three significant things that a Nazarite's supposed to do. Not touch grapes, eat them, touch them, have anything to do with them. What's the second? No razor. And the third one? Stay away from dead bodies. All right. So keep that in mind as we start to look at who Samson acts like. Mm -hmm. Right. It's ultimately what's going on in the heart. Yeah. Right. The haircut, the, the grapes, and the, and the staying away from dead bodies are all outward signs of the inner dedication that is a, a person who is made in Nazareth. And you'll hear this word of separation. They have separated themselves from the Lord, meaning that from their other vocations, they're separated and they are focused on this one task until that task is done. It's meant to be a timed event. It's not something that usually one would make for their whole lifetime. It's more, I, I've got this task ahead of me. And so it's a little bit unique that Samson's from the womb to be a Nazarite. All right, what is the purpose of 
Samson's Nazarite separation. So from chapter 13, what is he supposed to be doing? Do we get indication of what his Nazarite vow is for? So, so far we just know he's going to be separate, right? But is there any direction? To get that direction, you go back to verse 5. So chapter 13, verse 5. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and a razor shall come upon his head, for a child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. It's an interesting phrasing that he'll begin to save. It's not that he will save, but that he's going to be the beginning. So that's his Nazarite vow. His time of separation is to be the beginning of saving the people from Israel. The Philistines. We do have a parallel to John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist is the one who prepares the way in the wilderness, and ultimately it's God who comes and delivers the people out of the wilderness. There's, um, there's a lot that goes on with Samson. To understand our own sense of Nazarite vow that we might be asked to do as Christians, I want you to turn to John chapter 17. So this is the high priestly prayer by Jesus. And so this is the prayer that Jesus has um, when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same night in which he will be betrayed. Um, and he has asked the disciples to stay awake for a while. He's going to go off and he's going to pray. And this is the prayer that he has. And specifically now the portion that's in 13 through 17. He says, Now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, as they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So what are we to be separated from? And what are we not separated from? So let's first start by what are we not separated from according um, there in verse 14. I'm sorry, in verse 15. What does he ask us not to be taken out of? Yeah, I do not ask that they get taken out of the world. So as Christians, our separation is not to be from the world. But what is our separation supposed to be from? So if it's not of the world, Jesus says, but keep them from keep them from the evil one. And this is a wonderful affirmation of the material creation of the world. That, that the Christian view of the world is one that is both a place where God can be at work in the world. He does not ask that we get taken out of the world, right? Though we're not of the world, we're to be in the world. But there's also this acknowledgement that there is evil, the evil one at work in the world. So Christians are always filled with this tension of having great confidence that this is a world that God has created, but it is also a world where evil can be at work. So we're not, um, we are not hiding away from the world. Ron? Luther had a great concern that the monastery would encourage people to leave the world and to think that success with God was found only through spiritual enterprises and not through the earthly living of our vocations. Yeah. So uh, as Christians, our vow is not to be away from the world as much as we can, but actually to be in the world, but to be separated from the evil one. And, and, and this is, I think, you know, always lived in tension. What does that mean? Um, I, I think of the tension, for instance, in Houston, uh, there is a tremendous, and this happens up here as well with Ella's house, um, with Deb from um, Faith Troy. Uh, uh, but there's a, a ministry that's called Jesus Loves Porn Stars. 
And it's all about encouraging women in congregations to go early in the evening and provide casserole dishes and other care ministry to the women who are at strip clubs and to let them know they're loved. Um, it's, a, it's a hard ministry. Um, but it's that idea of these are people who are in the world. We want to help them know that they're loved. You know, those kind of ministries are those borderland areas where, like, probably not everybody's best equipped for that challenge of doing that kind of ministry. Um, maybe a person can, I've talked to, uh, I was talking to someone down in Houston about this, and they said, it's easy the first time you go because you think you're going to change their life. You're going to bring this little care kid in a Ziploc baggie, you're going to bring them a meal, you're going to pray for them, and you, they're just going to change. And then you go back a few more times and you realize they haven't changed yet. And you start to get a little bitter, like they should know better. And the bitterness starts to eat away at the servant's heart. And they said, we just realized that sometimes that not everyone's equipped for that task. So this tension is real, I think, in John chapter 17. And that's why Jesus prays for it. You know, Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't pray for the stuff that's easy. He prays for the stuff that's hard. Howard. I, I missed the second part. Yeah, as we, we get in that mission, our heart gets to develop, and, but it's, it's a hard thing to do. All right, turning now back to uh, our question sheet. Question seven is who, who's the driver act of activity in chapter 13? So, you know, a plot has someone who a character in a, a, a story that has the ability to change the action of what's happening is a main character. You know, as you're, if you're drawing out a, a, a character uh, plot and you're developing who your characters are, you've got the supporting characters, you've got the, the main actor is the one who has the ability in a story to change the direction of what's happening. So who's that in chapter 13? The angel of the Lord, yeah. So uh, the, the mother and the father are there. Samson's going to be born. But from the very beginning, God is the one that has the ability to change the story. Isn't, isn't this the only place in Scripture where the, the angel of the Lord is mentioned so many times? I mean, I, I, I think of... It's sure there, that's for sure. Yeah, in verse 22, Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. And, uh, but his wife said, You know, God could have killed us already. I think he has a plan for us. The wife speaks some wisdom there. All right, we're going to read now chapter 14. And uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about Samson as a character. Yes? No, not the... Until the temple's built, the high places are, 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 um, are places where the sacrifices can be made. So they, they haven't broken. No. After the temple gets built, it becomes, the language becomes a little bit tighter. And so they're okay. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines, then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. Behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat." But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. 
After some days, he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, so the young men used to, for so the young men used to do. And as soon as the people saw him, they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you, if you can tell me what it is, within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothing. And they said to him, Put your riddle, that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. In three days they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said to him, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my father, and shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted, and on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people, and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day, before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and struck down thirty men of the town, took their spoil, and gave the garments of those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. All right, so what can we learn about Samson's character? Stern? Strong, for sure. Strong desires? What's that, Phil? He's ruled by his desires. Um, there are these moments when the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him and he can do something. Um, he's, he's someone who, when the Spirit is upon him, he, he acts, too, yep. Uh, what is God doing? What, what is God's... What's God's intention, do you think, through this marriage? That's, yeah, that's what it says it to us right there. Yeah, in verse 4, his mother and father did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Yeah, God, God is going to start to bring tension between Israel and the Philistines. That's it. There's no longer going to be this uh, master-servant thing going on. Samson's going to show he's got the power to do stuff. Um, if you want, we had some names of cities. If you turn to the front page of your city, you'll see... Um, the, the cities Timnah and Ashkelon on your map there. And um, he's from Zorah. So just above Bethlehem is Zorah. That's where Samson is. Then Timnah is where he went and he found this woman. And she's in Timnah. And then he goes down to Ashkelon. And, and uh, so that gives you a sense of just the, where all this is taking place. He is, in, he is moving from just that private life to a public life of ministry. So the Spirit of the Lord has moved upon him that it's time now to do that which you have been a Nazarite for. I don't know the answer to that yet. You know, he's a young man who's been given great skills. Does he know where the skills come from? Does he acknowledge um, yet? Do we have anything from Samson that acknowledges that God is working through him? Um, we, the narrator tells us. No, Phyllis was right. It's not there yet, is it? Um, the narrator's telling us.
But from Samson's words, we don't have that yet. Yeah, and that's going to be something for Samson to figure out. Where is his strength coming from? We're not told what he did to show his strength or what he did. No, we're not. There's nothing in the story that says that, is there? Not yet. I mean, when he kills the lion, it says it's actually because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him that he was able to do it. And I always think the, um, the reference point for what this looked like was, is kind of interesting, you know. He tore the lion in pieces, as one tears a young goat. I don't know about you, but I haven't torn a young goat before. But I mean, it says, you know, of course, as you know, as one tears a young goat, he tore... I don't know what that looks like. But he's, he's able to do it. Um, all right, so what has he done so far? You know, he, he's broken some of his vow in... in uh, he, he's he's uh, from number six. Remember, our, our three vows are um, don't touch the grapes, don't use a razor, don't touch dead things. So he got the honey out of a dead thing. Um, it, it, a chill has come on in this room. and So it's not your own feeling right here. Um, Dave and I, have, uh, he's working with SysTemp. There's three thermostats in this room. There's one in the baptistry. There's one on the wall behind the back balcony uh, pew. And then there's one right by the um, um, cry room. And it's supposed to work so that um, 72 degrees is, is in common with all three. But when one of them, and like for instance, maybe the one that's in the balcony is at 72, there's supposed to be a computer algorithm that gets the other two close to 72. But I think Dave and I are thinking what's happening is that the, the thermometer that's, the thermostat that's in the balcony is causing the system to shut down too soon. Because, you know, it's higher. So he's, he, he's trying to get them to work on it. Um, just, I mean, perspective-wise, when I came at... Um, at 8 o'clock, it, it was like warm in here, like overly warm. So it's, it's, a, it's a computer issue. Pardon me? <laughs> Let's get rid of the computer. <laughs> um, question five on your study sheet. Was Samson justified in killing 30 men of Ashkelon? So let's look a little bit closer at this. This is chapter 14, verse 19. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. So where are those who have told um, the answer to the riddle from? They're from Timnah. They're not from Ashkelon. So he kills 30 men from a different town to pay off his debt of 30 garments. Is this justified? Well, one thing to consider is they're all Philistines. They're all party of this. Um, he's, he, you know, there's this drive to think, you know, Samson's just driving this way. But the narrator makes sure that we know it's the Spirit of the Lord that's upon him. So when he goes to Ashkelon, God is the one that's led that moment. This is a very confusing thing for me because I want to be able to dismiss his activity in Ashkelon and just say Samson's just a, a vengeful idiot that's using his strength. But he's not. He's someone that's being led by God to do this. It's, it's strange. The other thing is um, how did his wife get convinced? Aunts, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. It may be an indication that these 30 men had raped her until she answered. Um, Samson, he, he, he doesn't have anything more to do with this woman. Uh, 
That's a good detail there, Bill. All right, let's let's um, we got about four minutes left. I, I we'll read fifteen one through twenty. After some days, at that time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with the young goat, and he said, "I will go into my wife in the chamber." But her father would not allow him to go in, and her father said, "I really thought that you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not your her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead." And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches. He turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they said, Samson the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. The Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. He struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Adam. Then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? They said, We have come up to bind Samson to do to him as he did to us. And three thousand men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, We have come down to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. The ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire. His bonds melted off his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it, and with it struck one thousand men. And Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey have I struck down a thousand men. As soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called ramath Lehi. And he was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, You have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant. Shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi, and water came out of it. And when he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore the name of it is called en It is at Lehi to this day, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. All right, so um, the role of this chapter. What does, at the end of the chapter, Samson is what? Samson's the judge. He's now a judge. In, um, we'll, we'll look a little bit more at some of these questions, but now it's time. I uh, want to say thank you for being at Bible study today. And we'll finish up with uh, some of these questions on 15, and then we'll look at Samson and Delilah. And uh, I want you to, um, as you, you think about chapter 15, to consider the violence that is done uh, to Samson's uh, father-in-law and his wife by the Philistines. And Samson makes the point, when harm comes, it's not going to be by my hand upon you. Um, the Philistines do it to themselves. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, protect us. Keep us safe in these times of vengeance. Forgive us for having our own struggles. And give us courage to resist the temptations of the world and to trust that we are never alone, that you will keep us from the evil one. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a great day.